cranial cervical syndrome, basically a problem with your neck that's causing neurological symptoms, then I think this video is going to be helpful for you. We're going to walk through a couple cases or uh, lightly describe a couple cases where this is one of the problems that we were looking at and how we go about diagnosing it kind of in real time. And uh, we'll talk about a case we did yesterday. My name is Dr. Nathan Kaiser. I'm here at the Kaiser Clinic in Chelsea, Michigan, and we specialize in helping people that have neurological symptoms get better. And the way we start with that is by helping them figure out what is going on first. So let's try to find the mechanism. So if we think about real quick, this overlap, we've got kind of this common feature where we'll see people that have CCI, or we might look at this as cervical joint syndrome. Regardless, basically we're looking at the range of motion or the travel that the vertebrae in the neck are able to achieve, right? The movement that they can achieve may either be too much or too little. So in the case of craniocervical instability, we have ligamentous damage or changes with genetic potentials. Um, usually this is something we're looking at Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, or we're looking at a traumatic injury, whether that's a car accident, falling and hitting your head, slip and fall, sports injury, whatever it is. And sometimes these two things tend to overlap. People with EDS may have these injuries that exacerbate it, uh, cause damage in the ligaments. They allow the joints to move too far. And when they move too far, they can intrude on other functions, whether that be neurological or vascular. So we are kind of seeing that commonly these folks are having a combination of what is being perceived as this neck problem or craniocervical instability, and it overlaps with neurological symptoms. But what do we have to account for that's really important is we have all these different ways in which that can come about. So we know that we can have problems with the brain itself. So if someone has, for example, let's say we're in this scenario, we've got CCI, we've got some neurological symptoms, but we don't know if these neurological symptoms are relative to maybe an injury that was sustained that did affect the brain, that did actually affect the tissue in the brain, similarly to what we'd see in a traumatic brain injury, concussion along these roads, right? So we have to figure out, is the problem in the brain itself? Secondly, we want to look at, is the problem happening because of proprioceptive problems in the neck where the joints in the neck when they send signals to the brain it changes the way people feel like they are living in space and it can make them dizzy they can have problems with spatial awareness they can feel nauseous and, and we can see changes in feeling like my head is floating or i don't know where i am i feel like i'm gonna fall over maybe even getting vertigo and then we have to go up the chain one more and we can think about multi-system integration. And I know that that doesn't mean a lot to a lot of people, but basically what we're saying is if we are somebody that has a problem with the neck, we're having these neurological symptoms, we need to also understand if an injury is able to damage the neck to a point where it causes neurological symptoms, we may be experiencing something where the brain itself isn't processing correctly, particularly in the brainstem. So we might see areas in the cortical brain, and we may see the fact that we aren't integrating these sensory systems as well. And then the last piece that we wanna pay attention to is the vasculature. So if the neck is able to move too much or in an awkward position, it can actually compress the vessels that are gonna bring blood to the brain. So these would be the carotid arteries in the front or the vertebral arteries in the back. We can also see that we can impede the drainage from the brain as well by affecting internal jugular vein. So I'll bring this back around. So if I'm if I'm somebody that has this kind of problem in my neck or suspected problem in my neck, I'm having these neurological symptoms. A lot of times they're things that are relative to hypoperfusion. I'm feeling lightheaded. I'm feeling dizzy. I'm feeling brain fog, nausea, headaches, blurry vision, on and on we go that way. When we're looking at it like that, we kind of need to make this differentiation of whether or not uh, this is something that is neurological or this is something that is, so is this a neurological problem or is this a vascular problem? So in a lot of people, we will find that when we, we go through do testing, we're looking at eye movements, we're looking at physical exam findings, you can see very frank areas where neurological function, it's like hitting a target. You can see right in that specific area, it is not working well. But then sometimes we have to look at it and say, is that neurological symptom or problem because it's not getting enough blood flow? It's not getting the fuel to be able to run effectively. So how could we differentiate these things? And one of the quickest ones that we can look at is just in a simple examination we want to look at changes in head position. Okay. Very simply put, a lot of people will experience, and we 
I've seen this a couple times in the last week, which is why it's on my mind, where they'll say that their symptoms seem like they come out of nowhere. And that's pretty common. But what we actually find is their symptoms are actually pretty specific, especially relative to head movement. So we will do the normal barrage of testing that we normally do looking at function. We'll listen to the heart. We'll look at the way the eyes move. We will see the way that they move in space, watch the phonation, the way they speak, have them do thinking tasks, kind of all these different ways that we look at the brain. And then we'll do the same thing, having them turn their head, rotating it to the sides, tilting it back, tilting it to the sides. And what we'll find is that in some of these cases, we see a very marked difference for how they perform with their head turned versus their head in a neutral position. So that may even mean when they turn their head, they start to, you, know, you ask them just a simple question about their past, like where are they from? Do they have any family members, something like that? And they can be talking and then turn their head one way and it just goes away and they can't speak. They can't even like remember what speaking should feel like. And then bring them back to the middle and letting them recover. They can answer again, turning the other way they can answer. And you can see these, these very frank differences. Um, and they're really helpful. So we just take what it would be a normal, kind of normal neurological examination, but then we want to take it on the move and we want to see, is there something that's happening in the neck that is causing an occlusion of those blood vessels? And then we want to look at it, are they in the anterior compartments, carotids, or are they in the posterior compartments? They're going to tend to affect different areas of the brain. We get different signals. And then the other thing we want to do is once we notice that, then we use Doppler ultrasound as a way to measure the blood flow changes. So for example, um, in the case we looked at yesterday, we saw a drop of almost 50% of the amount of blood flow traveling through the right middle cerebral artery when they would turn their head to the right. Turning to the left, fine. Both arteries, fine. Vertebral arteries, fine. But that right carotid turning to the right falls apart. And that's when all of those symptoms would, would come and present themselves. So I guess the moral of the story here is when we're thinking about people that have this suspected CCI, a lot of times it's, it's kind of like a confusing road to travel, but we want to make sure we're looking at, are we having neurologically based symptoms where we're affecting the brain, spinal cord, nerves, what's going on? Or are we affecting the ability to deliver blood flow to those areas? In either case, we've got a different problem that we need to solve in order to allow that person to regain functionality. Because that's really what it's all about is even if you've got something like EDS, where it's a genetic problem, you're going to have more tissue laxity than average. So what? It means we have to figure out to what scale is that affecting you and is there, is there something that can be done so that we can strengthen this system and allow you to be able to operate and live your life? Too often we find that people just kind of resign themselves and say like, oh, I don't think there's anything you can do about this, when in actuality, there may be something that's very obvious to do. Um, we just don't bother to look for it. So CCI, neurological symptoms, we want to differentiate. Is it a neurological problem? Is it vascular? How do we localize it? And then what do we do going forward from there? Is it where we're going to have to work on creating a different range of motion in the neck? Do we have to create some strength? Do we have to look at positioning? Do we have to order some uh, advanced testing? Starting to solve the problem like that. So hopefully that's helpful. Let us know. Um, leave a comment or even better, send us an email. But we hope it helps. We'll talk to you on the next one. Thanks.